take a seat for a little moment, but I'm going to get you back up in a little while. I have been so excited to be able to preach to you this morning. Um, it's been a while, so I'm like, I'm raring to go. And I've been really loving this series. Those of you who've been following us on the series, we're in 1 Peter, and we're talking about the now and the not yet. So that we're living in a present reality on the earth today, but actually there's a not yet. We're looking towards what God's got for us as his kingdom is unveiled on the earth. And that ultimately when we go to heaven, totally we will walk into that fulfillment. But you know, even the Lord's Prayer says, our, Lord, our Father who has art in heaven, thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're asking for to happen here on our earth as it is in heaven. So there's a kind of a, a moving towards what heaven would be like moving towards what the kingdom of God would be like. And we've heard the last few weeks that we are a kingdom, we are a people, we are a royal priesthood. We've learned that we have an identity in Christ and because of who we are, we live differently. There's an expectation of us and Christians that we would live in holiness, that we would be set apart, that we'll be distinguished by what we believe and who we believe in that we would walk differently on this earth. So it's been radical. This book has been really radical, what the expectation God's putting on us, but not on our own, that he gives us his Holy Spirit and he gives us a community and says, we are a people, we are a holy nation, we are a priesthood. And I love the verses at the beginning where it says that we are like living stones that we're being built into a house. Talks about Jesus being the capstone, but we are like living stones. And a few years ago, we took that literally. Steve and I decided that we were going to actually get some stones and put the leaders' names of this congregation on these stones. And we have them in our office and we pray regularly for the leaders in this church. We pray for all of you, but we pick up the leaders and they go like, they are helping to build the structure to this church. They're helping to have framework and carry weight within this congregation for us to build this house. And every now and again, we will pick out a stone and we will pray for them. I've picked out Katie Campbell by accident. There is Katie Campbell. We will pray for Katie. And you know, one of the things I love is my grandchildren especially Caleb, who's four, loves nothing more than to come up to our office and to look at the stones. And he's just learning to read. And he'll say, what does that one say, Nana? Who's that name, that Nana? Oh, we haven't got that name. We need to put a new name. So he helped me choose a little bit before. And so we now have Indigo Brave, who's age one, on a stone, who he's seeing as a leader here in the house. Living stones. God uses each and every one of us to build his house. What he's doing here is something amazing. To see you all come out for the vision offering, you're saying that I'm part of what God is building here. I wanna pledge something, I wanna punt something in. I'm saying, doesn't matter how small, doesn't matter how large, I'm saying we are part of what God is doing in this house and God is doing in this place. Amen? Amen. So we are on chapter three. Now, I have to say, when I realized that I would be preaching on chapter three, I read this passage and I thought, oh, heck, how come I got that one? I was like, oh, this has got to be hardest. Apparently, it's known as one of the hardest passages, and it can cause a lot of kind of angst, particularly in women's minds. Okay, so, but bear with me, we're going on a ride, it's okay. I even thought that there might be a visiting speaker. We got an opportunity of a visiting speaker coming in and I almost gave this passage away for this visiting speaker and then it didn't work out. I'm like, okay, Lord, I get the message, the visiting speaker isn't coming, I'm speaking on this passage right now. So you're ready for it because actually at the beginning I thought, oh no. And then I did some research and I did lots of reading around it and lots of kind of contextualizing what this, this passage is about. And now I really love it. And now I'm thinking, gosh, that's what God was saying through this passage. So I won't avoid it anymore in the future. I'm going to embrace it. And let's hope that we can embrace it together. So we're going to read this passage together. And my time is short today. I think I'm going to do a blog or something because I've got so much to share. And I haven't got a lot of time. So let's read these passages together. It's going to come behind me. Here it is. So together, shall we stand? 
Yeah, let's get you to stand, why not? Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words, but by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Amen. Please take your seats. Lord God, we pray for your word this morning. May it bring truth, may it bring light, may it bring hope and healing in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to be in there where it says, wives, be submissive to your husbands. So if any of them do not believe in the word, then be won over by your behavior of the wives. Um, you see, when this was written, and the context is really important, in the ancient days there, it would have been in the Greek and Roman Empire there, it would have been um, something of great uh, difficulty if a wife, to see this was a new faith that was coming into society, if the wife had become a Christian and the husband was not a Christian, then that could bring real contention into the household. Because it was assumed that if the husband had a new faith, then the wife and the household would all actually assume that faith as well. And we'd be taken into that faith and into that religion. What Paul, Peter's addressing here is saying to the women, for those of you who live with men who are not, do not know the word, are not Christians, are not saved, that the way that you behave will actually affect whether he comes into faith or not. So my point is, you know, how do women have radical faith? How do women have radical influence? And this is how Peter was saying, that you've got a radical influence. That's my first question. How do we have radical influence? You have radical influence by the way that you behave towards your husbands. There he's saying it's not by words. He wasn't saying that you don't have to talk to them or you shouldn't speak. But when he was saying your behavior towards them will actually affect the, the, the fact whether they come into God's kingdom or not. And it's actually quite radical that we're saying that actually the behavior when you see the purity and the reverence of your lives. You see, at that time, there would have been um, religions, and many pagan religions, that would have worshipped many gods. Polytheistic, they would have had lots of gods that they would have honored. But to watch a woman in the home, and she would be watched... She would be watched by society. She would be watched by everyone in her household. But to see that she was committed to one God would have stood out from the rest of the culture. The fact that she would have been committed to one man, that she lived in purity, would have stood out for the rest of the culture. The fact that she was committed to internal sanctification would have made her stand out for the rest of the culture. They're saying to wives, submit to what is happening in your household because the God has got a bigger plan and purpose as what is going on in your household because through how you behave, your purity and your reverence towards your husband, you can have an overwhelming influence over his spiritual life. That's powerful. That is really powerful. You see, in 1 Peter, in 1 Peter 2, the chapter beforehand, it didn't say just wives. I mean, these passages particularly looking at wives who lived with non-Christian husbands, wives in general, husbands. But there's lots of principles in it for if you're not married here this morning. And lots of principles if you do want to get married, that there's kind of like a steer at how to relate to one another. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, it did say, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. 
So this, this was for everyone. This is male and female. Live such good lives amongst the pagans. And Peter was emphasizing, you're living with a pagan husband. Live such a good life that actually they are, you are being a witness to them. They can see your good deeds and glorify God in heaven. Our actions actually really matter. Actions speak louder than words. <laughs> Little example, we had our grandchildren the last, uh, over the weekend just for one night so that Katie could have a lie-in for her birthday, special treat. And we decided that, you know, and we talked about them having a bath and, and one of them wasn't very keen in having a bath. The other one doesn't have any option, she's one, so we did. So, <laughs> so the, the words and the communication and the argument meant that he wasn't having any of it. So the action was we filled the bath with water, took the one-year-old, put them in. He was curious and ended up stepping in. I'm not sitting down. No, that's fine. Carried on. The action of us kind of like persuaded him without the words, but the actions meant he actually did what he was asked to do. Actions sometimes can be stronger than words. How can our actions portray to the people around us that we're living good lives? Well, for example, lack of gossip. That is radical. If you could be in a workplace, you could be in a home, we have no gossip. Remove yourself from the gossip that's happening in society, in your workplace, even in your families. Loving the unloved, how about that one? Is that radical enough to step out from what's happening in culture? Going the second mile and blessing people rather than expecting to be blessed. Living with integrity, wherever you are, wherever you are. And I know this is going into prisons next week, or I know it's going into prisons. Integrity, wherever you are. Can you stand apart wherever you are? Whether you're in Bury or whether you're in Colchester, you're watching me online, that we can live good lives, that we can show good works to the people around us. You know, here as a church, we do go into, and I don't think we've given you an update, but 77 prisons now that our services are, transla- are given into and broadcast every single week. And we love the fact that God has given us that opportunity into prisons. That's probably 33,000 people they think definitely watch us every single week. It's kind of a, a good work because we're here to do good. That was a slogan that we put for many years ago because we believe it, we're here to do good. And this passage is saying your good works, your good behavior can actually have influence for eternity. What else does it say? It says it's not just your good works, but it's the attitude of your heart. It goes on and says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is great worth in God's sight. Gentle and quiet spirit. Now, some women might sit there and think, I don't want to be gentle and quiet. I want to be bold and I want to be a leader and I want to be confident and I don't want to always be quiet. But what this is saying is actually a a humility of quietness is about you that can spring influence. You see, the words here for quiet, and I think we've got the words here, these are the words that we could associate the words with gentle and quiet. Quiet, calm, peaceful, restful, merciful, tranquil, tender, and gentle. So if we want, it's encouraging us to be these words. The opposite, maybe if we don't want to be these words, what's the opposite? Thunderous, loud, piercing, crude, tempestuous, crazy, blasting, wild, and disrespectful. Don't know about you, but I don't want to be any of those words. I don't want to be disrespectful. I don't want to be wild. Wild. I prefer to be quiet and gentle. You see, the reason being is our, our ultimate leader, the God that we follow, Jesus, was gentle and mild. There's a verse in scripture where it says in Matthew 11, take my yoke upon me, upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. It's the only place where Jesus describes his own character. So what these scriptures are saying, be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Be gentle, be humble in heart and be a witness wherever you are. You know, the ultimate thing that Jesus does 
He forgives and he gives ultimate sacrifice. And I believe each and every one of us have to come back to him every single day and say, is there anything in my heart that I need to forgive, Lord Jesus? Whether it's with a spouse, whether it's with a family member, whether it's with a work colleague, whether it's extended family, that there's things that are done to us that are hurtful and that we need to come before Jesus again and say, Lord, I forgive, help me to forgive. Ultimately, that's what Jesus does. He forgives us, and the measure that we've been forgiven, he asks us to extend to the people around us. So what sort of women does he expose that Peter wants us to be like? Somebody who's like Jesus, somebody who forgives, somebody that is integral to God's plan. This is my second question. How do women play an integral part of Plod's plan? It carries on in these verses and explains. And he says, it's not by using your beauty in order to bring influence. Now, we know beauty does actually attract. Beauty does sell products. Beauty is used throughout all marketing campaigns in order to get people to buy things. And one Peter, here Peter is saying, don't use your beauty for your influence, but use who you are for your influence. Use what's going on internally rather than what's going on externally in order to influence. You see, the beauty industry is absolutely huge. Do you know that the beauty industry is worth globally, let's look at the the figure here, $534 billion is invested in the beauty industry. And cosmetics alone is $105 billion just for cosmetics. It's a massive, massive world industry. It's a massive, massive thing that sells. But what Peter is saying, there's nothing wrong with being beautiful, adorning yourself, putting things on that make you look good and make you feel good. It can bring a sense of self-care and dignity when you clothe yourself well, when you, you have your confidence because of what you're wearing and how you look. It can give you confidence, but what he's saying is don't put that confidence in the external. Put it on what's going on in the internal. You see, your influence as a woman And as a man, but I'm speaking to you as women here in this room at this moment, your influence is powerful. It really is powerful. And these verses, I've often thought that it was trying to make women downcast and tread women down and push them down. But actually, this is radical. Peter is saying, you have influence. And your worth is not in how you look. And that is still a pressure on society today. Your worth is in not how you look. It is in who you are and what God has done for you and what Christ has done for you. That's where your worth comes. And that's what you need to be confident in. Don't rely on the internal. You know, it's again, our hero, Jesus. It says in Isaiah, these amazing verses, it says, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. And yet we do. It's not through beauty. It's because of who he is and what he's done for us. The verses carry on to say, For this is the way the holy women of the past who put the hope in God used to adorn themselves or make themselves beautiful. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. I've got a lovely photo there, picture of the photo, picture of Sarah and Abraham. I love that look on Sarah's face. She's watching what Abraham is explaining and talking through. And uh, she has some adornments and beauty and gold on there. I don't know if you know the story of Sarah and Abraham. But I love the story of Sarah and Abraham. You see, God made a promise. And first of all, he promised to Abraham that I am gonna give you a great nation. I'm gonna make you a father of the nations. And I'm gonna give you descendants as many as the stars in the sky, or as much as this grain of sand that's a grain of sand that's on the beaches in front of you in the desert. You know, he said they had this promise, and he gave him this promise when he was 75. 
And when he got to 99, he still hadn't got that promise fulfilled. He was still waiting for these ancestors that God was going to give him. And you know, he, said, he came to him a number of times to Abraham and said that he was going to make him into a great nation. When he was aged 99, he changed his name for Abra to Abraham, father of many nations. But then these verses in Genesis 17, it says, As for Sarah, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that you will be the mother of, she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Sarah had a promise as much as Abraham had a promise. 25 years in between. Sarah decided that the promise was taking far too long and she got her maidservant involved and said, why don't you make my maidservant pregnant and then at least there'll be a, a child in the household that we can actually outwork this promise through. So she, he dutifully obeyed and there was a son that was born called Ishmael to a lady called Hagar. And you may remember the story that once that child had been born, Sarah felt really jealous because her position, she was worried, was being usurped and that Abraham was going to love Hagar more than her. And so she started punishing her and said to Abraham, what's happening? What's happening? And she was getting worried. She was getting fearful that he was going to love her more than Sarah. And so he said, do what you want. And she started mistreating Hagar. She ran away. God saw Hagar and said, submit to Sarah, go back to the situation, and I will bless you. You know, Sarah then, again, received Ishmael into that household, but always wanted that promise. God came again to Abraham and said, it's going to happen. I'm going to change your name. It it will happen. It will happen. And Sarah, I'm going to change her name. It will happen. And you know what Abraham's response was? It says here, If only you could establish my covenant with Ishmael. And God says, no, I have promised to Sarah, your wife will bear a child. And three visitors came and they were at a tent and that's where they lived in this tent here in the desert. And three visitors, they often think that was an epiphany. It was God himself that came and visited Abraham. And they said, this time next year, there will be a child. Sarah will have a child. Initially, when Abraham heard the news, he laughed. God didn't rebuke him. He thought he was crazy because he was getting old. 25 years later, Sarah then heard from these visitors that she was going to have a child a year later. She laughed. She was inside the tent and she laughed. She thought, me, now, I'm this age, I'm really old. How can I actually have a child right now? I'm beyond the menopause. It's not going to happen. And you're old, and will God give me this pleasure right now? And the visitors said, where's Sarah? I said, she's in the tent. And the man came and said, why did you laugh? And it says in the scripture, she lied because she was afraid. And said, I did not laugh. And the, the visitor said, you did laugh. It's amazing to think that Abraham laughed, he didn't get told off. Sarah laughed, she got told off, kind of. You know why I think it was? Because God had promised and said, Abraham and Sarah, together, I'm going to make you mother and father of the nations. The promise is for you both. The promise is for you together. Don't doubt the promise, Sarah. Don't doubt. Don't try and give it away to somebody else. Don't try and pass on the promise. God has got something specific for you that when you work together as husband and wife together, there is a promise that is coming to the whole household. Come on, Sarah. Stand up to what God has given you, that promise he's given you, and don't doubt because I've got a part for you to play in this as much as Abraham has got to play as well. Don't doubt it, Sarah, you're part of the plan. I used to teach in schools. I used to do um, lessons, and I used to always have the kids that I knew that wouldn't do what they were asked to do. And you got to the point where you thought, I'm not going to tell them anymore because I know it's going to be hard work. But they were ones that you always did what you wanted them to do. 
And that occasional time when they let you down and they didn't actually do what you expected them to do, I'd be disappointed and they'd know they'd be, I'd be disappointed. And I remember one girl once saying to me, she expects me, she expects us to do it well. She expects us to do it right because we always usually do. I said, you're absolutely right. There's an expectation level that is higher for you than it is for others, because I know that you can do it, and I know that you're there, and there's an expectation to move forward. The expectation in God's heart for Sarah is saying, don't give away the promise. Don't pass it somewhere else. There's father and there's mother. There's husband and wife working together to fulfill the promise that God's got for you. You know, as I draw to a close, I want to ask this question, are we truly better together? Are we truly better together? And it says in these verses, you know, it says that husbands be considerate as we respect them as the weaker partner, as heirs with you in the gracious gift of life. Not my favorite verses to be described as weaker, but again, I looked into it and I thought, what does this actually mean? And at that time, and still in society, it can be today, in many places around the world, but even in in our society today, some verses use that, some translations use those verses not as a weaker partner, but with less advantages. And in those days, men would have had a lot more advantage than women. Social status, education, opportunity, wage disparity, a lot more advantages than women in society. We can debate, you know, the point about weaker childbirth. I don't feel like that's a weak thing to do. There's things that women have to contend with, with their bodies. But there is a sense that men can be stronger physically. There is a sense that often women can be afraid of men because they know that they can outrun us. If they wanted to floor us, they could. There'd be nothing that we could do. There's a sense at times that women can feel afraid of men because of their strength. But you know, Peter was saying, you know, treat your wives with honor. Treat them with honor. Use your strong advantages in order to empower and to level up women. Those verses continue to answer say, it says, because you are fellow, let's see here, my verses here, show respect as heirs with you in the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Peter was saying, you are heirs together. And some verses even say, equal partners together, that God has given you a gracious gift together. And together, we are stronger. Together, we are better. Can we see a vision where we can walk in harmony together? I know there's marriages that are challenged. I know that are relationships that are challenged. But if we can see a vision of us walking together, working together, I see it like, when somebody's up on a ladder and they're painting high on a, on a, a house and they're painting up on the high, somebody else is there holding the ladder and being a ladder holder. And I see it like that often in marriage or in a relationship, close relationship. You're holding one another's ladder. And at times, the vision is the person who's painting at the top. And then other times, they may come down the ladder and somebody, and somebody else takes a turn and they start the painting. You see, I believe truly here we have grown something special. We have grown something special here as a church. We believe in mutuality. We don't believe in hierarchy. We believe in mutuality, that we have authority, that Steve and I both have authority. I don't see myself any less of a pastor than Steve sees himself as a pastor. We feel called together to this church. We feel called together to do what we do. I feel called to pray for you. I feel called to guide you, to help you. You know, when we get to heaven, I don't believe that Steve would be the one that have more responsibility to say, what have you done with your life than I will when he says, God says, what have you done with your life? I think we will be judged separately, but we're seeing how we've worked and functioned together. 
That's why I don't like being called the pastor's wife, if you ever caught me out saying, because I am a pastor. And God has called me, and I feel as called as Steve Phil called. And this passage, when it was Sarah and Abraham, they were called together. You know, when I first came on staff here, I had an idea and things I'd want to do. There were seven men that had to agree to do it before actually it would be put into place because there was three on the lead team and then there was, three, there was four uh, trustees and they were all male. And I have to say it's credit to Steve and it's credit to the guys in this congregation and this leadership team that have allowed the women to be empowered to walk into the gifting that God has given them. And I wanna say that God wants us, each of us, to walk together because I truly believe that we are better together When Adam and Eve were created, they were created and they said, rule and subdue. Rule and subdue together. It was only after the fall that there was different roles were given. Rule and subdue. God created them equally in the garden. And I believe there is a way to behave with one another. There is a way to treat one another. But God is not distinguishing and saying one is any greater or less than each other. So this passage to me has brought freedom. It's brought revelation. And if you want to read any more, I've put something on your notes there if you want to read it. Can you stand with me? I'm going to pray with you in order to close. Oh, Lord God, there may be many questions that have been raised by these texts today. But Lord, most ultimately, we want to know that We want you to know that we love you. We want to be obedient to you, Lord God. We want to be your ambassadors here on the earth. Lord, we want to do this in unison. We want to do this in harmony. We want to do this together, Lord God. I thank you that you've called us and you've chosen us. You've shown that we can be powerful to influence the world around us. And ultimately, Jesus, you've encouraged us again to be more like you that we can be humble and gentle in heart, that we can walk with obedience and faithfulness and forgiveness in our hearts. Oh, we love you, King Jesus. I want you right now to put your hands out to the front of you, that you put your hands in front of you. And I'm just gonna take a few moments if there's anything that you feel that God's spoken to you about, anything that you're carrying right now, anything you sense that God has kind of revealed to you, I want you to just take a few moments to just put your hands outstretched and have a moment with God. Just speak to God yourself. Ask Him to forgive. Ask Him to help you. Ask Him to give you wisdom. Ask Him to give you clarity. Come Holy Spirit. Jesus. Now, as you do that, I want you to turn your hands over and let everything that you had here to drop to ground, to fall away. Give it to God. And now with your hands twisted back up, palms to the ceiling, let's receive a fresh anointing from the Holy Spirit that He will give you His strength and His grace to live his, your life on this earth, representing Him, believing for the not yet, but asking for heaven here on earth, even as we commit ourselves to Him this day. Amen and amen. Let's the worship team lead us. If you enjoyed this video today, why don't you click subscribe and click on that notification bell to get a notification the next time we upload a video. And if you're new or you've been coming to the C3 Church for a little while now, why don't you find out what your next step might be in the journey of faith? Click on the next step link in the description below to find out what your next step in your journey might be.